online at crossculture.church. From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Crosswalk, a weekly sermon podcast from the pulpit of Cross Culture Church. Thank you for joining us. Now here's this week's message from Cross Culture Church. Hey guys, how's everybody doing this morning? Awesome. Man. Okay, so hey, if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open them up to James chapter 1 with me. We're going to try and wrap out James chapter 1. I appreciate Kale's introduction earlier, uh, and, and he said that uh, we were going to try and wrap through uh, the book of James, wrap up the book of James this morning. And um, this week, I cannot tell you how much I've wrestled and struggled. I had no idea where I should go with the book of James. I, there's so much there as I, as I delved in and I began to read and study and pray. I just, man, it was, there, there's so many places I could have just gotten stuck and stopped. And, and so there's no way. I would encourage you, if you can, today, go home and try to read the rest of James because it is an incredible, incredible letter. Um, but that being said, we're going to stop uh, just, just in James chapter 1 this morning. We're going to start down around verse 19 by the time we get there. But uh, like he's mentioned, my name is Charlie. Uh, if you're new here, uh, don't worry, so am I. It's all good. Uh, I've only been here for, a couple, for one Sunday. This is my last Sunday here, but you guys should keep coming. Um, I, I believe what God is doing here is a really special thing, a very special work in this church. I'd encourage you to, to, to buckle in and push forward and trust that the Lord is going to do what he's called us to do. Uh, you realize there's this there's this tension in the Christian life, right? That that there's the all these things, all these commands, all these all all the stuff that that's supposed to show up in our lives, all these all this fruit that's supposed to come out of us, and yet there's no way that you and I can manufacture those fruit on our on our own. The way that fruit happens in the life of a believer is not because we think really hard or we try really hard or we discipline ourselves really hard. It's because we draw close to the Spirit, and as we draw close to the Spirit, He begins to manifest Himself through us, and fruit begins to show up. So, so, so that's my one word of encouragement. So a little bit about me. I got to tell you guys a little bit last week about my about my family growing up, uh, you guys, some of y'all got to meet Stacy, my wife, last week. We've got three incredible kids. Uh, Stacy's with the kids this morning uh, over at the church that we've been attending. They had some stuff they were supposed to do over there, so they're all over there together this morning. But for the last seven years, we've lived in Orlando, Florida. And, uh, and so we moved up here a few months ago. And as we did, my son was, was making book recommendations. He's in seminary, so he's reading constantly. And so, so there's a book by John Eldridge. It's an old book called Wild at Heart. I, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, it's, it's a book for guys, so ladies don't feel left out. But in that book, he, there's a quote that he says that every man, deep down, every man longs for a battle to fight, an adventure to win, or an adventure to live, and a beauty to save. A battle to, vi- to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to save. To save, and I, I think there's there, there's just a lot in that quote that, that that we could dive into. But I think it's true that that men deep down, all of us desire to be the hero of someone, the the, the rescuer of someone. We desire to to live an adventure, not just to have a dreary day to day life where we just go to the office and do our thing and come home and do that thing and then get up the next day and do it again. We we want an adventure to live, a beauty to save, and all of us desire to have a battle to fight. If you've ever had young boys in the house it doesn't really matter how 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 strict you are it doesn't really matter what toys you will let them have and what toys you won't my 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 wife when 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 she was a young mom was very nervous about letting the kids play with guns and so they didn't have gun toys in the house but it didn't really matter because they had legos and so my we we would build lego swords and we would have battles in the backyard if you've ever swung at a kid with a lego sword you know that it's a lot of fun but but it doesn't last really long because legos they're not really meant for that kind of tension but 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 it doesn't matter because there's something about boys. They just want to win. There's a battle that we just, and we don't even, if we don't have a battle to win, we make one up. Right, guys? Right, right? And, but, but here's the thing. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe this is just me. This is just an honest pastor moment here. The biggest battle I've really had to fight in my life, in our culture, and the, the way in which we live, is most of the time, it's my weight. Anybody with me on that? Am I, am I the only naturally fat guy here? Like, I get, Kale gets up here and he makes announcements. So I'm like, I am genetically never going to look like that. It's so frustrating. You go, out to, you go out to lunch with skinny people and they're just like, yeah, I'd like, I'd like the pizza and the hot dogs and just, can, can, you, can you put a big side of mashed potatoes on that? And they're just eating the whole thing down. I can't gain weight. And I'm like, I hate you. I absolutely, I, like my best friend in high school, like he, he was taking like protein supplements and all this stuff trying to gain weight. And I'm just like, you are such a loser. It's really not, come with me for like a day and a half. I will show you how to gain weight. 
So, so, so I mentioned being in Orlando because in Orlando I decided, you know, th- this has got to change. Something's got to stop. And so, so over the course of about two years, in, in my last two years living in Orlando, I lost like 75 pounds. All right, it was cr- it, it, it was hard work. It was a lot. Of, it was a lot of time in the gym. It was a lot of not eating. It was just it was just. So I lost like seventy five pounds, and I moved to Raleigh, and I found thirty of them. <laughs> I, I had no idea they ended up here, but so 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 it, it's it's been you know change of life, change of structure, change of everything, change of schedule, and so so we've been trying to figure. I've I've been working on getting a little bit down, a little bit down. It was so frustrating because I was like 30, 30 pounds for my goal. Because you get this you get this picture in your head of what could be and what should be, and then you start working towards that picture, and then something happens and it kind of sets you back, and then you got to go back and redouble your efforts to get back there. And that's that's kind of what I've been doing. So it's been a it's been a journey. It's been a learning process. Like for instance, when when you go work out, I, I don't know if you go work out, but when you go to the gym and you lift weights. Uh, something physiologically is happening in there. What's going on is you're straining your body, you're straining your muscles, and, and, and you're stretching them and pulling them in such a way that's causing micro tears in the muscle. All right, so 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 like when, when you lift the weight, you're actually you're actually ripping apart your muscle. All right, and 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 when that when that happens, that's why you know blood flows and, and and lactic acid goes in there, and that's what when you wake up the next morning and you're sore and you can't really wash your hair and you're like holding the toothbrush down and doing this. Uh, anybody who's been to the gym after a long time knows what that's like. You know, it, that, that, all, all of that is built up there because your body is trying to heal from the damage that you've done. And what happens is over time, as it continually heals, it, it sends more blood, more protein, more, 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 more building material to those muscles. And that's why they get bigger. In order, to, in order to build muscle, you've got to tear it down. You've got to strain it and stress it and put it under tension, otherwise it's not going to grow. You following me? And last last week we talked about James 1, where where James tells these impoverished, scattered, broken believers who have grown up in church, who are very religious, that they should consider it all joy as they pass through various trials. And and, and if, if you wrote this down last week, great. If not, I want you to write down again that God is more concerned, God is more concerned with our completeness than he is with our comfort. God is more concerned with what he is accomplishing, what he is building, what he is creating in us than he is with our comfort in the moment. In other words, God is in the process of allowing us to be pulled, allowing us to be strained, allowing us to be put under, tre- under, under pressure and tension because he knows that faith, just like a muscle, has to be exercised. Faith has to be stretched. Faith has to be pulled. Faith has to be under tension in order for it to grow. I mean, and let, let's be honest. When you look back over the course of your life, are, are, is it during the seasons when everything was right and everything was good and, and your salary was what you thought it would be and your home was what you thought it would be and your kids were doing everything right and there was no problems and, and the boss loved you? The boss loved you and your neighbors were great. Were it in, was it in those moments that your faith grew? Or was it in those moments that you became sedentary and settled? And honestly, in a lot of ways, kind of forgot that there was something else you were supposed to be doing. It's in the moments when God allows us to be pulled. It's in those times when God allows us to be strained. It's in those times when we feel the pressure and the squeeze of life. The trials and the temptations of life that we remember and we're reminded not only of our dependence upon the Father, but also that there is something else in life that we have to be focused on and we have to allow our faith in the fact that God has made promises and God has said things and God is doing something in our lives to overcome those other voices in our head that tell us that that we should just walk away and we should lean out, we should just find a different path and we have to exercise our faith. Because get this, faith is not a tool. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But then Ephesians 2, 10 says this. Because you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works that he has laid out for you. 
In other words, yes, grace, grace has been expressed. Grace has been given. By faith, that grace is activated in our lives. But there is something then that God desires for us to do. There is something then that God desires for us to become. There is something that God is doing. Check this out in James chapter 1, verse 19. Know that, or know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, listen, know this, get this, don't miss this, church. James says, the wrath of God, or the wrath of man, does not bring about the righteousness of God. In other words, what is it that God, through these tensions, through these trials, through this temptation, through stuff, what is God building in us? He is building himself. You know, Romans chapter 6 says we have been buried with Christ so that we may rise to live this new life in him. In other words, it's the life of Christ that's supposed to be manifest in us. That's what makes us culturally different, church. That's what makes us look different from the world. It's not that we're good people. It's, it's not that we're nice people. It's not that we hold the door open for folks. It's not that we give money. It's not that we're generous. It's that there is something in you that is beginning to transform you. Grace is changing you so that your heart resembles God's heart, so that we love the things that He loves and we hate the things that He hates. And, 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 and that sounds weird. I know, I know, because in this culture, we're not supposed to hate anybody, right? That, that's, that's what we say in church. We, you know, we just love everybody. But listen... There are some things in my life that I love. I love my children. All right? And because I love my children, I hate some things. I hate anything that brings them harm. All right? Love and hate are not opposites of one another. You cannot love something and not hate something else. The, the opposite of love is not hate. It's, it's, it's lust or apathy. And so, so what, what James is saying is, listen, you, you, there's some things that you're going to, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And what he's done is he, he's laid up in the very first few, first, first few verses we talked about last week that this idea that God is doing something, God is, is accomplishing something, God is building something, God is completing us through trials. And then he gives kind of some examples of, of what they're dealing with. Then he comes to this passage, uh, kind of completing and rounding out that thought and says, listen, God is putting in you, God is building in you his his own righteousness not a righteousness from your works not a righteousness of what you've done not all the good things that you can do but his righteousness manifest in you and your anger about things that don't matter isn't going to get you there therefore he says i want you to put away all anger all hatred all malice all sorts of wickedness i want you to cut some things out of your life that are keeping you from manifesting the righteousness of god Because God is about doing something in you. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Remember, it it also comes back in Philippians chapter 2 that Kale mentioned earlier. It says in chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Paul writes, he says, As you've done in my absence, now as you've done in my presence, even more so now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. In other words, there's, some, there's something about you and I. We, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. We're saved through faith. But there is something then at that point that we need to begin to do. We need to begin to work out this thing that God has put into us, this, this righteous gift that he's given us, that, that Romans 6 says that, 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 that we have been given this gift of righteousness. That, that has to be worked out now. And then it says in verse 13, knowing that it's the Father, it's God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, there's this, there's this somehow this commingling of you and God in faith where he is working in you, causing your heart to be changed by grace so that your heart desires the things that he has for you to do. And James says, listen, if we're going to become that people, church, religious people who've grown up in this a long time, religious people who know the system, religious people who, who know how to come in and set up the stage and, and sit down and worship and then clean up and go back and do it all over again next week, people who've been through this cycle, people who this is now our routine, th- th- listen, this isn't something we just come to and leave. This isn't an event. This 
is something we have to work out, not on Sunday morning at Leesville High School, but on Monday morning when we go to work, on Tuesday afternoon when we have lunch with a friend, on Wednesday night at soccer practice for our kids. The righteousness of God, loving what he loves and hating what he hates, has to begin to work out of our lives so that, it, so, so that everybody sees. And he goes here, and he, and he says this, listen. Verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently into, a natural, into his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away, and at once he forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. All right, let, let's, let's go back and just break this down a little bit. He says, he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Okay, now I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that I'd, I'd lost a lot of weight, and I, I still have a lot of weight to lose. But, um, you know, I, 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 can, I can talk to you pretty intelligently, actually, about the science of nutrition. I can talk to you pretty intelligently about the science of cardiovascular health. I can talk to you pretty intelligently about the science of, 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 of bodybuilding, weightlifting, personal fitness. There's, there's a lot I've learned over this, over this several year journey that I've been on as I've, as I've, I was trying to figure out you know, how muscles work together and you know, how it's 90% diet and 10% exercise, but that 10% exercise is kind of a mental thing that affects the 90% diet. And you, you know, you've got to have so much protein and, and so much carbohydrates and so much, so much fat in your diet. If you cut out all the fat, it's not going to work. If you you go real light on the carbs, you know, your body's going to kind of shift and go into kenosis where it's going to begin to feed off the fats instead of feeding off the carbohydrates. And protein is what the body's using to kind of build muscle and, and create new structures in you. And, and the more muscle you have, the more weight you're going to lose because your muscles are actually burning fat all the time instead of, you know, just when you're doing something. There, there's a lot that I could talk about, but let's be honest. If you get a chubby guy up here telling you how to be fit, what does that really sound like? I mean, when's the last time you went to a person? We went, went to the gym, and the personal fitness guy was wearing a size 42, like elastic band weight, eating a donut. I mean, it, the, the, listen. There's a reason that they all go into weightlifting competitions. It's a reason they all love to have their shirts off. They spent 30 years trying to figure out how to be awesome, and they want everybody to know. Because it doesn't do any good to know what it is to be fit, but not live it out. You can deceive yourself into thinking you're an athlete because you know how to, you know all the rules of basketball. You know, you know what it is to dribble, what it is to steal, what, you know what a crossover and a, and a spin is. You, you know how to box out. You know what rebounds are. You can tell the stats of every player for the last 20 years. It's great if you know that. That doesn't mean you're a basketball player. You, you, can, you can know everything there is about, to know about football. It doesn't make you a football player. It's one thing to know something. It's an entirely other thing to live it out. And guys, you know where that's the most obvious to see in everyday life? Is when we're going through trials. It's when it's hard. It's when the pastor leaves and we don't really know what we're going to do. It's when, it's when we thought we were going to have more time with mom and dad and now they're gone. It's, it's when we thought our kids were going to grow up to be this way and they grew up to be that way. It's, it's, when, it's when we thought we had enough money in retirement and we didn't. It's when I thought my career was going to go this way and now it's taking a hard left turn. It's when our husband has disappointed us or our wives aren't what we thought they would be. It's, listen, it's in those hard moments of life when we had an expectation and now life has grossly undercut it. When we don't know what comes next. When, when we don't know how we're going to pay the rent next month, when we don't know how we're going to get by, when I don't know what to do now, that, that is when we have the opportunity to live out our faith. Because listen, listen, faith is not a tool. All right, and, and it's, not, it's not something that you can pull out of your back pocket so you can manipulate God into giving you money. 
or manipulate God into giving you health or manipulate God into giving you ease or manipulate God into making somebody do what you want them to do. Faith, faith isn't a tool for us to use. It's a muscle for us to exercise. It's something that we have to put into action because God hasn't given us carte blanche. He hasn't said, look, you do whatever you want and I'm going to come through. You just have to believe. What God has said, what God has done is he's made promises and he's written a book and he's, he's given us a revelation of himself so that we know who he is and we know what he's doing and he know where he's calling and we just have to believe he's going to do it along the way we have to hold tight not on who we want God to be but who God has revealed himself to be and to believe that he is going to live up to his promises and he is going to provide and he is going to do and he is going to take and he is going to be because he's promised us he's going to How stupid is it for us, church, to believe that we can trust God with our forever, but we can't trust Him with our right now? He's not promised to give you an easy life. He's not promised to give you prosperity. He's promised to be faithful. He's promised that you will see good in the land of the living. He's promised that He will provide for all of your needs, not out of His riches, but according to His riches. And that's a big difference. I mean, mean, stop and think about that. If if you start providing for needs out of your savings account, your savings account's going to get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, for some of us, it'd be like, okay, gone. But, but if God's providing according to his riches, that means in proportion to his riches. That, there, there's nothing he can't provide. But listen, are, are we... And, and that, that's, that's, that's easy to get excited about in church, and I get that. But are, are we really living that way? Are, are, are you love, husbands, are you loving your wives... Are you sacrificially loving your wives the way Christ loved the church? In in other words, are are you standing in the gap between them and the rest of the world, providing protection, providing sustenance, providing for them, giving them space, being their savior, letting them be the beauty that you rescue? The way that Christ has stands in the gap for you. Are you doing that for them, trusting that no matter how they respond, no matter what they do, Christ is going to be enough to provide for your needs. Wives, wives, are, are, are you respecting your husbands? Are you loving your husbands the way that Christ desires the church would love him? Looking to him as your source of provision, looking to him as, as your sole source of affection, looking to him to, not, to, not to give you value, Look, but looking to him because he holds you in such high esteem. Trusting that when he falls short, because he will, that Christ will provide for all of your needs. Are, are, we, looking, are we looking at the way that we give? Are we looking at our finances and saying that, that we're going to be generous? We're going to be a generous people. We're going to be a generous family. We're going to be a generous church. Because, not, not because we just have so much extra, but because we believe that God is going to provide for all of our needs according to His riches in glory. And we're not going to outgive Him. So, so if, if, if my role, if my life is to send the gospel to the nations and I can't go, then I'm going to give so that others can Are we, are we living out this faith? Are we living out this belief that God is enough? And that, that becomes really stark and it becomes really clear when life is hard, but sometimes when it's just normal, everyday business, we just don't even think about it. And James says, listen, listen, listen. God is doing something. God is building something god is seeking to accomplish something in you so there's some things you're gonna have to cut out of your life in order to do that and and get this guys that's not all bad things i mean look look at what he lists right here he says um 
<clears throat> he says, therefore, put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Um, <clears throat> How many of y'all were late to church this morning? Anyway, just go ahead and raise your hand. Everybody knows. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's all right. It's okay. So, so when, I was, when I was young, when Stacy and I first got married, we were, in a, we were in a young married Sunday school class with a guy named Les Coggins. Now, Les was, a, uh, was our Sunday school teacher, but he was a retired Air Force colonel. And he was a by-the-book kind of guy, like you could imagine a retired Air Force colonel would be. And, and so, so, so he, he, he just had his thing, and he did his thing. And, and, and man, Les was, like, Les was like the perfect man in, in, my, in my 22-year-old head. I just couldn't figure out how it could get any better than this. I remember sitting one down one time, and, and Stacy and I, I know you guys have never had this problem, but we just had an issue when we were young married. And it always seemed like we were late. I mean, my, my, for me, for when I was growing up, my dad's saying, if you're five minutes late, you're, or if you're five minutes early, you're ten minutes late, you know, that kind of thing. You got to be there. You got to be there early. I would show up early to everything. I still do. I just show up and I just get there. It's just, it's just if I'm not there early, I'm stressed out. It's just, it's just who I am. Now, Stacy's idea of on time is if, if it starts at 1015, I'm walking in the door at 1015, all right? I'm sure none of you have this tension in your household, but it was a, it was a real issue for us. And I remember I, I was asking Les about it. I'm like, what am I supposed to do about this? It's just, it's just like we're just two completely different people this way, and I don't feel like it's, it's, it's not what we're supposed to be. It's like, well, th- this is how I dealt with it. One time, his wife, uh, they, they had to leave by 9.15 to get to church on time. And so one time, he told his wife, look, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving at 9.15. And so at 9.15, he got up from the couch, he walked out to the garage, he got in the car, and he left. And they lived a half an hour away from church, so Kathy comes walking out all ready to go, and she's like, Les, where are you at? And at that moment, I realized that I was not going to be able to live my life the way that Les lived his. <laughs> but, but how many of you, how many of you have had that experience on Sunday morning where you're just waiting for somebody to get ready, Right? I, I, there, there's, a, there's a shift that happens in kids around 11, 12 years old. Uh, at, at 11, I could not get my son to take a shower. You, you, guys, you, guys, you guys with me here? At 12, I cannot get them out. It's like, it's like you go in after they take a shower and like steam comes falling out. The paint's curling off the walls. They've been in there for an hour and a half. It, it's, just, it's, it's just before then, they walk by the mirror, they're like, oh, hey, looking good, and then they walk out. Then at 12, something happens, they walk by, they're like, wait a second, I got to fix this. All right, and, and you can tell, you can tell, you spend a little bit of time around middle schools, you can tell when that shift happens. It's around seventh grade, because all the sixth graders are just happy to show up. They're like, deodorant, what? <laughs> now, And then the seventh grade locker room is like Axe body spray everywhere. (laughs) Listen, how foolish would it be? How foolish would it be for you to get up in the morning, walk to the bathroom, and you're like, hair sticking up over here. You got that white mark on your chin from the drool that you were doing last night. All the stuff in your eyes. You're just like, (laughs) and you walk in, you look in the mirror like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something. Maybe when I get home from work. And then you just go. Listen, listen, that's what, but that's what James says. That's what James says you and I are like. We, we come, we come to, to the law of liberty, the word of God, and we stare at it. And in this, we have two things. We have a mirror that reflects who we are. And we have a picture of who Jesus is. And, and, and we, see, we, we see the standard of God's holiness And we see reflected in that all the ways in which we fall short. And then we begin to read the story. And we begin to see not that God is judging us for all the ways that we've sinned, all the ways that we've fallen, all the ways that we fail, and all the ways that we fall short. But instead, instead, we see that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We see that God, in His infinite grace, is no longer holding our sin against us because all of His wrath was poured out on Jesus. 
we see that now there is no good thing that's going to be withheld from us because a God who's given up his own son for us, what else is he not going to give? We see all the liberty, all the freedom, all the grace, all the goodness of God poured out on broken people like us so that we as these filthy, broken jars of clay are carrying around this treasure beyond measure. And what that's supposed to do, church, is it's supposed to melt our hearts towards God. It's supposed to soften our hearts toward God so that our hearts become transformed and begin changing and begin moving and begin begin looking a little bit more like Jesus. But what James says, you and I, the religious do, as we come up to that mirror and we stare at it intently and we see everything that's wrong with us and we're like, "Eh, God will forgive us. And we walk away. Church, If the grace of God isn't changing your heart, if the grace of God hasn't changed your heart and isn't continually changing your heart, if you are not being transformed by the truth of the gospel, if you are not being changed little by little, bit by bit, shaped by the fact that God has spoken approval over your broken mess, then I believe it would be James's position that you don't understand the gospel or grace at all. And he goes further and says, true religion is this, to visit widow and orphans in their time of need. Now, here's, here's the thing about widows and orphans. And, and so what a lot of people do is they're like, oh, we've got to start orphanages in Honduras, or we've got to start our clothes closet. We get... here's, listen, widows and orphans were the two classes of people in the first century who could do nothing for you. They had nothing to offer. They had no money, they had no position, they had no standard. They, they, they had nothing they could bring to the table. If you were going to go help them, it was only because you were going to help them, because there, there was nothing to get back from it. There was no reward in Roman culture for being generous to them. There, there was no payback, there was no, there was no business to be done, there, there was, there, there was no, 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 no acclaim to be had. There was, there was nothing to be gotten from going to widows and orphans in their time of need, except the fact that you went to widows and orphans in time of need. And what James is saying is, listen, true transformation of the heart means that you are not doing good because it's going to be good for you. True transformation, gospel transformation means that you are going to push down into those places where you can't get anything out of it and you're still going to love people. So let me ask you a question, Cross cross Culture Church. Where in your life are you bringing Jesus to the least of these? Where, not, not, don't tell me about mission trips. Those are great, I love them. Don't don't tell me about about programs. Don't tell me about stuff the church is doing. Where in your life, and you're eight to five, with your kids, when you're in soccer practice, when you go to Chick-fil-A, not today, but tomorrow, when you go to Chick-fil-A, when you go where you go, when you do what you do, where is the love of Jesus? Where is the gospel of Christ? Where is the goodness and the righteousness of God being pushed out of you onto the lives of those who have nothing to give you? Because James says, listen, true religion is not, is not being good when it's good. True religion is being good when there's nothing in it. True transformation is being kind, being righteous, being loving, taking the message of the gospel to those who have nothing they can give you back. And James says, everything else, everything else is deceiving yourself. So here's my question this morning, church. Are you putting into practice, not on Sundays, not in the hard times, but on Wednesday afternoon when when all is right with the world, on Thursday night sitting at home with your family and your kids, on Friday, when you and your wife sit down to make out your budget, are you putting into practice what it is that God is putting into practice?
We're glad you joined us for this week's message on Crosswalk. God has invited us to know Him through His Word, the Bible, a perfect record of God's revelation to man and applicable for every area of our lives. And if you're in the Raleigh area, we invite you to be a part of Cross Culture Worship. We meet at 1030 every Sunday morning at the Leesville Road High School, a mile and a half south of I-540 Exit 7. We're a church, but instead of religion, we're about relationships, and instead of rituals, we practice realness. Cross Culture Church, a new church for people like you. Learn more about us, who we are, what we're about, what we do, and what we believe. Visit us online at crossculture.church. Cross Culture Church, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross. Online at crossculture.church.